Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and just to get it out of the way, if you could please silence your cell phones. Um, my name is Mohammed Mohammed. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, and on behalf of our board of directors and staff, um, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to our online audience as well. Um, and it's also an honor to introduce and welcome back our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Shibli Talhami who will be giving today's lecture, which is titled Assessing the Impact of the 1967 War on the Palestinians 50 Years Later. So uh, of all the consequences of the 1967 war, uh, which include the decline of Arab nationalism, uh, the bolstering of U.S.-Israeli strategic relations, the expansion of Soviet influence, and the broader hit that collective Arab identity took, the impact on the Palestinians was the most fate, uh, fateful. In his lecture, Professor Shibli Tilhami will uh, articulate the most uh, the path that the war set for the Palestinians and why it has been enormously challenging for them to overcome even after 50 years of occupation. The lecture will also tie the current state of affairs to the diplomatic efforts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict proposed by the Trump administration. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Talhami. He's the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development and the Director of the University of Maryland Critical Issues Poll. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, his best-selling book, The Stakes, America in the Middle East, uh, was selected by Foreign Affairs as one of the top five books on the Middle East in 2003. Uh, his most recent book, The World Through Arab Eyes, Arab Public Opinion and the Reshaping of the Middle East uh, was published in 2013. Uh, Dr. Tilhami was also selected by the Carnegie Corporation of New York along with the New York Times as one of the great immigrants for 2013. Uh, Dr. Tilhami today will speak for 30 to 40 minutes and after that we'll have a Q&A session. Um, and we ask that you please wait for the, uh, for the mic to come to, uh, to you when you ask a question so that the online audience can hear. Uh, and the online audience can tweet their questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Shibli Talhami. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just share a few thoughts um, uh, with you about 67, uh, the, the war and its outcome and where it leaves the Palestinians today. Um, now, you know, a lot has been written over the past few weeks, as you know, because of the 50th anniversary of the 67 war. Uh, there has been a lot of writings on this. Uh, a lot of people have had, had a lot of thoughtful comments on different aspects of it. Uh, I also wrote a piece on it. Um, but what I'd like to do is, is give you some broader reflection that both history uh, about what happened right after and more about where, where things are now and how the two are tied together. Um, uh, I, I think obviously the starting point, as it should be, is with the human tragedy of, of people who are still under occupation after 50 years. I want to come back to that because uh, obviously there, uh, it, this is really, the I think, the starting and the ending point in, in some ways. Uh, but when you look at it, there's also been a the war of ideas uh, that has taken place over the past 50 years. Uh, and it certainly was started by the 67 war that set a path that is almost irreversible. And let me give you a, a little bit of a flavor even just how, how the Arab world has been transformed in terms of its leverage and in terms of dealing with this issue. Uh, uh, think first about the Arab Peace Initiative of 2003 or 2002, right after 9-11, uh, uh, when the Saudis initiated the so-called Arab Peace Initiative, uh, you know, uh, just 15 years ago, uh, that the Arabs put forth as a package to, to, assault, to address the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where the Arabs would collectively bring in, quote, their leverage or the incentive for Israel to make peace with them uh, as a way of <laughs> persuading the Israelis to relinquish the territories and accept a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and, and that was, of course, rejected. Uh, it was not accepted by uh, 
uh, by Israel, and, and obviously the U.S. didn't really uh, push uh, with the Bush administration, didn't push it. Now think now uh, that we have a regional initiative that looks like the Arab Peace Plan that is actually being supported by an American president, Donald Trump, and, and backed by the Israeli prime minister, uh, who, who, whose government, many, many of ministers don't even accept a two-state solution. And the reason for it is that now a lot of people, certainly around uh, the prime minister of Israel and, and in this country um, around uh, Donald Trump, who think the strategic picture has been so transformed that having the Arabs there is not going to result on any leverage uh, toward the Israelis, but rather would pressure the Palestinians uh, to make concessions more because Arabs want to make relations with the U.S. and Israel more than they want to extract concessions on behalf of the Palestinians. So that, that tells you a huge story right there. It's sort of the transformation of Arab position as it – now, it may be a, an incorrect interpretation. I think it is actually. And so don't get me wrong, but it's just the, the view of how Arab leverage has on the issue of Palestine has diminished over time is really startling when you, when you start with that point. But let's think about 67 particularly, and let me just go through a couple of the things uh, that I think um, had the consequence besides the obvious, which is that Israel came to control all of historic Palestine, including the West Bank and Gaza and Palestinians came under occupation, uh, that the 67, uh, in essence, began the decline of Arab support for the Palestinians at the very same time that it pushed the Palestinians to go it alone as much as they could with uh, bolstering Palestinian nationalism. That's what it did. Now, let me tell you why that is the case. Uh, first, when you look at um, the Palestinian struggle after 48, it certainly was about the right of return. And very quickly, it was about Arab nationalism because the Palestinians weren't really so much focused on their uh, nationalism or their sense of nationhood as much as the question of justice tied to a broader Arab cause. Uh, here you have the rise of Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, in 1952, uh, who was essentially saying to that that Palestine is the core of the Arabs, is the Arab nationals. This is an Arab cause; it's not a Palestinian cause. Um, and so, the, the the leader of the most powerful Arab state is adopting your cause. Obviously, Palestinians adopted Arab nationalism, and and the to the extent to which Palestinians adopted Arab nationalism. Uh, uh, people don't quite internalize that, I think, uh, because, um, uh, you know, it, it intellectually, uh, uh, emotionally, and certainly practically, because it was the, the most promising avenue to regain Palestinian right was seen to be in this collective Arab action. Obviously, even in 48, it wasn't really a cause, national cause that uh, the Arabs felt was at stake, but sort of Arab rights being taken and Palestine as part of the Arab world. And so much uh, so that I want to fast forward a little bit to, 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 to tell you how this preoccupation in Palestinian minds with Arab nationalism versus Palestinian nationalism, even after the Palestinian nationalism emerged, remained a real issue for Palestinians. Fast forward to 1982. Um, when Israel invaded Lebanon, and then the PLO became besieged, and then ultimately was forced to withdraw through a deal and went into exile in Tunis. And when the Palestinians left Lebanon, the PLO, obviously headquarters were moved from Lebanon ultimately to, uh, to uh, 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 Tunis. Uh, the first act was for uh, Yasser Arafat, instead of st uh, stopping in, uh, in, in uh, uh, an Arab country, he went through Greece, and the, the PLO magazine, Palestina Thora, immediately moved its headquarters to Cyprus, not to an Arab country, to Cyprus. And so I want to read you an exchange in the following issues 
of Palestine Thawra, which was indication about sort of the struggle that people were feeling, because this was a moment, obviously, where uh, the PLO was left to fight the war alone, and obviously couldn't succeed, and ultimately was forced to withdraw. And there were people like Muammar Gaddafi calling in the Palestinians, better, better to commit suicide on behalf of the Arab nation. Uh, if you recall that, that was kind of an example of Palestine seen not as a Palestine case, but as, as something for the Arab nation uh, itself. And so you have um, a student, a Saudi student, uh, wrote a letter to the editor of Palestine at Thora at that time. And he said, why did you not choose an Arab state as you center, as we all would have ex expected? Uh, I had not expected that the PLO would be so ungrateful to all uh, the aid provided by, its, uh, b by um, the Arabs, especially since the liberation of Palestine is the primary Arab concern. So this is a Saudi student writing uh, to Palestinian Thora editor. So here's the reply from the editor. He said, um, the PLO is not ungrateful. The deposits of one Arab state in the United States provide a sufficient budget for the liberation of Palestine in a year. Payment in blood cannot be compared with monetary payment. This revolution is indeed Arab, but Palestinian decisions shall remain independent regardless of the cost. Now, that was the response of the editor. But, so I want you to think about that for a minute, which is sort of Palestinian defiance at a time when they were left alone. But then there is an intellectual article that is actually the lead article, the lead article. And the lead article is much more reflective because this is just an exchange of letters, right? So this is not a central thesis of how the thinking goes. The lead article is about um, uh, who is, uh, you know, who's a Palestinian uh, and, and who's an Arab and what does that mean? That was right there and then at that time. And here's the lead article. The conclusion is the Palestinian considers himself first Arab, second Arab, and third Palestinian. And that was even at that moment of vulnerability because, because in intellectually, it was hard for Palestinians to peel themselves off from the pan-Arabism that was so promising to their aspirations. Uh, and because also they still needed Arab support. They were still vulnerable and they still needed Arab support. So and in 1967, that's when it all started, this dilemma. Because Nasser, when you look at Jamal Abdel Nasser, he captured the imagination of a lot of Arabs. We didn't have polling to know how uh, much, but we do know from events that have happened across the region and from testimony across the board that he captured the hearts of many, many Arabs across the board. Uh, and clearly, he made the question of Palestine a central mission for Arab nationalism. And in fact, one reason why he could make the proposition that Egypt should be the one who leads the Arab world, as opposed to Saudi Arabia or Jordan or other countries that were contending for leadership at that time, was one thing, the claim that Egypt is the only one that can use its military power to, to achieve Arab aspirations in liberating Palestine and in fighting off Western imperialism. The two were tied together. And obviously, he used the 56 uh, war uh, in which uh, the, the attack on him failed uh, as an example. Um, so so the, the issue for him uh, you know, was Palestine was so central to Arab nationalism, even aside from whether he succeeded in unifying countries together or getting Arab unity, but aspirationally, the promise, the psychology of Arab nationalism, uh, the, the psychology of the faith in Nasser rested on his ability to deliver militarily. And obviously in 67, uh, there was uh, tremendous um, uh, hope among followers of pan-Arabism, this would be his moment to, of delivery. And instead, of course, we know what happened. And, and I say, in fact, the Arab world into a collective depression uh, from which it, 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 some may not have recovered uh, because it was really the death of aspirations because that's how it was tied to this pan-Arabism.
Uh, and, and with it, obviously, in a way, the recognition that Israel was not uh, about to disappear, as some had argued, uh, and in fact was able to not only occupy the rest of uh, historic Palestine, but Egyptian territory and Syrian territory. And, and this is what I want to say about that, is that aside from the psychology of here is an Arab, the, 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 the country, uh, put aside Syria for a moment, uh, but, but certainly Egypt, because of Nasser's leadership role, put aside even Jordan, which joined the war uh, in 67. Uh, but Nasser was, of course, the, the, the center of the hope. And um, uh, certainly his, his military defeat uh, led to the death of aspiration. But the, the practical, in practical terms, that wasn't the biggest problem. In practical terms, it was that Israel came to occupy the Sinai and the Golan Heights. And why is that in practical term more important? Because that's the time when in fact, then Egypt and Syria had territories of their own to get back from Israel that they wanted more than they wanted to help the Palestinians. And ultimately that really opened the door for Egypt to go it alone in Camp David uh, because they wanted to get their Sinai back. Uh, and that became much more important. And up until then, uh, Nasser's uh, focus on Israel and Palestine wasn't particularly costly. And frankly, in 56, he certainly didn't start that war. It was a tripartite aggression on him. Uh, brought, you know, British, Fran Britain, France, and Israel launched that war in 56. He didn't initiate that war. He didn't want that war. And he didn't win it militarily, but he won it politically. Um, but so 60, he had not really fought a war over, over Palestine. He had rhetorically made the argument that he could win. And that was enough to get, to get the aspiration of the people, given what the interpretation of the framing of 1956. So uh, Nasser had not really uh, paid a particularly heavy price over Palestine, even by the way, in 67, I want you to, to think about this a little bit because there's a lot of reframing of what actually happened. Now, Nasser himself in, 50, in, in 67, by most accounts, certainly by mine, I've studied this, I've written about that. Um, um, and there are dis there's room for disagreement here because we don't know all the facts, still even now, 50 years later. Um, but in my own opinion, Nasser wasn't going out there to fight war with Israel. Uh, Nasser um, had been engaged in an Arab Cold War, what Malcolm Kerr called the Arab Cold War. And yes, he is, by the way, the father of Steve Kerr, who's, uh, who's uh, uh, just won the, the, the NBA championship last night for, for the Warriors. Uh, um, uh, Malcolm Kerr was somebody I knew who had been a, a professor at UCLA and then became the president of the American University in Beirut before, unfortunately, tragically, he was assassinated. Uh, he wrote a book uh, that was pretty well known called The Arab Cold War, um, to, uh, documenting that period from 56 through uh, 67, yeah, sort of where the Arab Cold War, by which he meant Nasser and the Arab nationalists versus their foes in the Arab world like uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Jordan, and the monarchies particularly across the Arab world. And um, when, you, when you look at that, um, Nasser, after ascending after 56, started declining in a little bit in his influence after he started intervening in Yemen, and the Yemeni intervention was not particularly successful. And then the United Arab uh, Republic that he formed with, uh, with Egypt, uh, with, uh, with the Syria and Iraq uh, disintegrated. So he was on the defensive in the 60s. Uh, and um, in fact, the whole tension started when the Soviets gave the Egyptians information that uh, Israel is massing uh, to attack Syria. And all of his moves were essentially out there to say, uh, 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 you know, if you go to war with Syria, you're going to war with me. He's using his leverage as a, uh, uh, the most powerful Arab state to, to gain more credibility in the, uh, in the Arab world. And so his moves were intended essentially as a deterrent. So if the Israelis didn't attack, as he probably suspected they're not going to attack, then he still would reap the benefits because he would have been seen to have stopped Israel from attacking Syria. Uh, 
and used his credibility as the most powerful Arab state to defend the, the Arab nation. So he certainly did uh, take moves uh, that were aggressive toward Israel uh, in uh, blocking uh, the, the, the waterway and uh, calling for the withdrawal of UN forces uh, from Sinai and then moving forces into the Sinai. But by all accounts, his intent wasn't to wage war. In fact, toward the end of the crisis, just before June uh, 5th, uh, uh, Egyptian diplomats and their allies, particularly the Soviet Union, were trying to do everything they can to prevent the war from happening because the assessment was Israel had the upper hand, actually. And here in the U.S., uh, the, the U.S. assumed that Israel would win, although there was some, you know, not with the same kind of uh, 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 speed. Uh, and the Israelis were trying to get the U.S. to support them to launch the war on June 5. Uh, now, whatever the Israeli moves were intended for, you can argue that they couldn't live with an, an ascendant Nasser because without a war, he would have won anyway, politically. Uh, you could make that argument. But there's no question, whatever their intent at that time and the calculation versus the prospects of war, that there were two things that they stood to benefit from that had a history in their strategy from the beginning. One is that they always thought that isolating Egypt from the rest of the Arab world was the best military strategy to not you know, have a possibility of an effective Arab attack. So in fact, in 1956, when they came to occupy the Sinai, uh, they uh, went into a campaign to try to persuade Eisenhower to at least let them keep a little piece of territory through which they can negotiate bilaterally with Egypt, to isolate so to make a bilateral issue with Egypt, to take it out of the Palestine equation. Uh, and there's no question that that had been a part of their thinking throughout. Um, and so this was obviously whatever the causes, the immediate causes were, uh, there was some benefit that would accrue uh, by holding on to Egyptian territory, and that proved to be right because it was, in fact, the Egyptian incentive ultimately to have a peace agreement. Um, and the second is that whatever the reason was for the immediate um, attack on the, uh, the, the, the immediate occupation of the West Bank, uh, and uh, certainly the King of Jordan uh, joined Nasser at that time uh, in, in the war, uh, but the extent to which uh, the Israelis moved uh, across, taking East Jerusalem as well as the entire West Bank, um, is of course debated now, whether that was planned or not planned, uh, um, and whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, even from the Israeli point of view, the Israelis debate that to this day, as you know if you're reading uh, the press and analysis. Uh, but here's one thing that we know about, and that is that the Israelis had never accepted the armistice line with Jordan as a final boundary. That is, they've never accepted that, uh, you know, the, the armistice of 1949 between uh, the West Bank and Israel is the final boundary, because it wasn't. Uh, and, and this, by the way, is not just a function of the lure of the rise of religious parties in Israel. There is that, because after, you know, the invoca invoking uh, biblical metaphors uh, after the occupation of the West Bank certainly solidified uh, the, 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 the groups within Israel who were uh, more religious Zionist uh, than, than, than secular Zionist. But if you look back, um, as we have, we have a record. Uh, I've uh, written about this before. Um, for example, uh, in 1949, when the armistice lines were being discussed between Israel and the neighboring Arab states, one of the questions was whether if, in fact, Israel was offered peace by Arab states, whether Israel would accept it. So Moshe Sharet, who was a secular Zionist, who was the foreign minister at the time uh, uh, of Israel, right, you know, said in a, in a government meeting, he said, if Egypt were to offer us a peace agreement along the lines of the armistice, post-48 armistice line, we should take it. That's fine. Uh, if Syria should offer us one, um, the only reservations we have is really that we don't like the government of Syria, but he had no problems with the boundaries. But if Jordan were to offer a peace now along these armistice lines, we should not take it. Uh, there was no question in that, that, that the, 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 whether they're secular or religious, uh, there was no acceptance of, of that line. Uh, uh, 
within within Israel itself. And obviously, what happened afterwards, in a way, reveals that because a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of the pro proposals that came out of the secular uh, Israeli parties were not uh, full withdrawal. And obviously, the annexation of East Jerusalem took place almost immediately after. So, uh, so whatever you know, whatever the immediate causes were who fired the first shot. Uh, there was something bigger going on that was going to set a path, and we and and, and it set that path. So, um, what about Palestinian nationalism? This is what I will talk about very briefly because I talk about sort of the decline of Arabism because we know that that set the mood not only uh, in terms of 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 uh, setting back the aspirations of of pan Arabism, but also of reviving statism, by which I mean uh, Egypt wanted its own territory more than it wanted anything else. Uh, Syria wanted to negotiate ultimately about the, the Golan Heights, that everybody was negotiating about their issues uh, with Palestine in, in a way paying a price, initially a smaller price, but ultimately a bigger price. And, and certainly this was uh, accelerated by the 73 war where the Arabs did better uh, than before and actually restored uh, 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 some of the dignity that they had lost in 1967, uh, but nonetheless did not, were not able to uh, regain control of either the Sinai or the Golan Heights, even separate from the West Bank and Gaza. So basically, it then set the track for Egypt to go it alone uh, with with Israel, and ultimately, even Syria went into bilateral talks that failed, but nonetheless, they were bilateral talks. Uh, for peace. Uh, but for Palestinian nationalism, there was an immediate reality, and, and I think you can see it where the PLO, which had been established in 64, but really under the control of Egypt, uh, immediately uh, seeks independence in 68 and revises a charter uh, that refers to Palestinian nationalism and immediately rejects 242 because 242, the resolution that was passed by the UN after 67 calling for Israeli withdrawal, also called for rights of refugees and didn't refer to Palestinian nationalism. And immediately, the Palestinians wanted to make a point of it in, in 68. What also happened in 68, if you think about that aspiration, essentially, the Palestinians saying, we've countered on pan-Arabism, and here's what we got. We've got to count on ourselves. And every time, by the way, across the history, you see that Palestinians uh, take things into their own hands when the Arab states start going back. Remember, the 1987 Intifada starts ultimately when the Arabs were preoccupied in the Iran-Iraq war for a full decade. Um, uh, 1993 essentially is a Palestinian initiative uh, to make peace with the Israelis separately when the US wasn't paying attention, the Arab world after the Iraq war wasn't paying attention to them. Uh, in 2000, after the collapse of uh, the negotiations, uh, took things into their own hands. So. We, you know, Palestinians have done that over, over the years, but in 68, it was a critical moment because this is the rise of the PLO as an independent organization, and with it, a lot of other Palestinian organizations, including the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. And one of the things that happened, if you think about the psychology, is just as people are depressed about the prospects of, of Arab uh, 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 action, um, you have this, uh, a, a lot of stories about Palestinian guerrillas carrying out uh, successful attacks. But one episode in particular happens almost immediately after the war in March 1968, and that is the Battle of Karami. The Battle of Karami in which um, uh, Israeli forces went into Jordan uh, to round up uh, uh, PLO uh, forces that were near the town of Karami. And uh, there's a whole dispute about the exact narrative about what exactly happened, how many Israelis were killed, um, how much did the Jordanian play a role, didn't play a role, who among the Palestinians played the role. Uh, and there's a dispute. We, we have some facts about how many uh, Israelis were killed or, uh, or uh, equipment was destroyed. But it, that all doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because the narrative that emerged, the Arab narrative, was that the Israelis were soundly defeated in the Battle of Karami, that the, the few PLO fighters alone did what all of the Arab armies couldn't do in 1967. Uh, and within 
couple of days, there were 5,000 Palestinians going to refugee camps to sign on to join the PLO. And so the, if, you, if you want a kind of a galvanizing episode, as always happens in the national movement, that was a galvanizing episode. And with it, you know, you, you emerge the Palestinian national movement. I want to talk about one more episode before I bring it to now and, and, and give you my reflections on where we are now. Um, and that episode is, is, not in, is, is 1974, when the PLO is recognized as sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Um, I want to talk about that because, you know, of course, um, 67 set a path. And that path included the 73 war, because 73 war became inevitable by the 67 war. And I say that um, for a lot of reasons, but, uh, uh, you know, it's not just, quote, the dignity that, that Arabs felt that was lost that they had to, to gain back, the, the international respect, but also the fact for Egypt itself, not just because Egypt hadn't given up on pan-Arabism, and, and even though, uh, you know, Nasser, um, those of you who know that history, Jamal Abdel Nasser, who was still loved even after his defeat, people may have been depressed about him, but they still saw him as a source of the hope. And in, in 1970, uh, the, the Jordanian forces go to war with Palestinian groups in, in Jordan and, and defeats them and forces them uh, out, of, out of Jordan. <laughs> And, the, and, and Jamal Abdel Nasser, the hero of Palestine, didn't raise a finger other than do diplomacy. He was trying to mediate, not to intervene. The, the Syrians tried to send some forces, and they did send some forces, and, and it wasn't, you know, they, they, they didn't, were not effective. But Nasser did not act. Nasser was mediating between King Hussein and the Palestinians, and almost metaphorically, he died the next day after he ended. He, he did the. He, he was in the middle of that mediation. Uh, it was so. Nasser was the one who started the planning for '73 war. He had this uh, rule of thumb uh, afterward that he announced: what is taken by force can only be returned by for force. This was uh, his his uh, uh, point, and he had this plan uh, to fight. Uh, a war as soon as possible, and he wanted to restore it. One, one thing that people don't quite get is that for Egypt, of course, there was a dignity issue about the location of Egypt, because one of the things that claimed that they were making about Arab leadership rested on their military ability. What else? What are you going to deliver if you're not going to deliver that? And th so for sure. But there's something else that people don't really quite understand about the path for Egypt. This had been a military regime. It still is. It has never left since 1952. Yes, it was popular, but it was a military regime. The legitimacy rested with the effectiveness of its military, because that is the that is the, the what 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 is the quarter, the anchor of the regime. And in '67, the military was humiliated. It wasn't just defeated; it was humiliated. And the Egyptians are wonderful people. I love Egypt. And when you look at the Egyptian sense of humor, most of you know the Egyptian sense of humor is, is, is just infectious. I, I, I love to, to hear uh, jokes about, and usually it's about self-depreciation, about the self. And they made so many jokes about the Egyptian army at the time uh, that it was really, really tragic in a way. It was, it was biting. And so the Egyptian military, the regime, needed to restore its dignity even for regime stability beyond its ability. So this was set in force. And in 73, Arabs did a lot better than anyone could have imagined. And in some ways, they did restore the dignity. And there was a moment, in fact, uh, uh, the first few days of the war when Israel contemplated uh, ideas that it had never thought uh, it would come to that. Um, and ultimately, it didn't succeed in returning all the territories, but it succeeded in restoring Arab leverage, uh, and it succeeded in getting international intervention, Egyptian, uh, American and, 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 and Soviet. Uh, and it succeeded in putting the, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict back on the, on the front burner. But here's the thing. So you're in the middle of this moment where the Arabs are celebrating what was a political victory. And it was a political victory, especially under the circumstances when nobody expected it. And they were also celebrating the emergence of their economic might. Remember, there was an Arab oil embargo that was connected to that moment. 
And so here is the ascendant moment of Arab influence for the first time, perhaps in the 20th century. Because when you look at it, you know, where, where is the other moment where you had this uh, sense of Arab success, of Arab pride, of Arab influence projecting itself? You could see it in the UN. You could see it in Europe. You could see it in meetings. You could see it in speeches. You could see it in how people felt across the board. Despite the limited effectiveness of the military, the fact is uh, they were far more effective than anyone could have Im imagined. And so here is the moment where you would think would be a moment of Arab revival. And in fact, by the way, there has never been a more effective Arab coordination in war than in that war. Because yes, the two parties that fought it out were Syria and Egypt. And by the way, they coordinated in ways that were remarkable, particularly in secret, since it wasn't really out there. Uh, but there was a lot of coordination for countries that didn't fight directly that helped bank it. That is the Saudis, particularly Saudi Arabia with King Faisal, and uh, Algeria with Huawei Bimidian. They were partners to that war. They funded it. They were, they were part, of, part of the winning, part, uh, vic, you know, the victory party that was, that was there. And so I say this, so you're looking at this, and from at some level, you would think to yourself, well, this is the moment of Arab ascendance. If Nasser had been there, this is the moment that he would have wanted to capture. But on the other side, this was exactly the opposite of that moment. Because it was the moment when the Arabs chose to say to the Palestinians, uh, yes, we embrace you, but you're on your own. And in fact, the way I read the 1974 Rabat conference that accepted the Palestinians, uh, the PLO, as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians uh, is that it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they tell the Palestinians, we support you, and we support your nationalism, and you, we support your right to self-determination. And the, on the other hand, says, but that gives us our right, the right to go it alone. It gave the right for Egypt to go it alone. It gave, so it became a national issue uh, and, and therefore, uh, in some ways, it reduced by default the nature of that, that Palestine was still supported by Arabs, but not as a cornerstone of, of Arabism, but as an, an Arab uh, country, uh, one, of, one of many. And so, in, in that regard, uh, I saw the seven, I, I wrote about this, by the way, because I did a lot of research on how this came about, because there was a debate in the Arab world and within, uh, among Arab leaders about whether to embrace the PLO. Uh, certainly Egypt up until then had claimed to speak for the Palestinians. I mean, Nasser certainly did because it was, he speaks for, the, for Palestine. Uh, Arab nationalists didn't want to separate them from the broader cause. And it was a question of who leads the cause. Uh, also, uh, the Jordanians always claimed to be speaking for the Palestinians. Uh, obviously Jordan had annexed the West Bank. Um, uh, in 1950, uh, claimed it as its own. And by the way, the Jordanians continued to pay salaries to Palestinians after the occupation all the way until 1988. Uh, King, King Hussein uh, lobbied Henry Kissinger, lobbied uh, 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 Anwar Sadat to not declare the PLO as the sole legitimate representative. He said, if you want to do that, either say, call them a representative, of one of many, or say at least the representative of Palestinians outside of Jordan, but not in Jordan, uh, and meaning also not of the West Bank. Uh, and ultimately, and, and Sadat was going back and forth, even though the foreign ministry was advising him he should recognize the PLO uh, as the sole legitimate representative. But when they went to Rabat, it was clear that uh, the uh, King Faisal and Huari Bimidian, uh, the president of Algeria, who gave the first uh, uh, speeches, were fully on the side of the PLO. And Sadat went along with them. And, uh, and that became uh, ultimately the deal of the day, uh, but not uh, without, uh, uh, you know, the King of Jordan uh, not fully accepting it. As I said, he never gave up uh, connection to the West Bank until 1988. And, and not without Henry, the Israelis going to Henry Kissinger uh, in the following agreement, disengagement agreements by Kissinger making a deal with the Israelis not to recognize the PLO or deal directly with the PLO, which remained all the way until the 
late uh, late 1980s. So it was a uh, th that that's point of emergence of obviously the PLO as a sole legitimate representative that led to more focus on Palestinian self determination and ultimately led to the idea of the two state solution being accepted. Uh, I just want to say that. So um, looking at that history, where does that leave us now? So let me let me give you. Um, just some thoughts um, uh, that I have, you know, more reflective thoughts on uh, some of the issues that come up and uh, and and what uh, what what I've uh, um, what I'm thinking about them. If I could find my um, my my one page here on that, but it, it doesn't matter. I'll do it without it. Um, um, uh, first, I think let's start again with the occupation. Um, you know, the term occupation, uh, which is now again in dispute from the Israeli right, not from the Palestinians, um, has been a double-edged sword for the Palestinians. Why is that? Well, on the one hand, um, it, it clearly means that Israel, uh, that the territories that are, quote, occupied are not Israeli territories, uh, that uh, they must be given back to their uh, rightful owners. Uh, that uh, um, uh, that what Israel can and cannot do in the occupied territories have limits under international law because we have a body of law that uh, uh, governs occupied territories. Uh, and in that sense, that's good for the Palestinians. But on the other hand, um, it, it has uh, done something different because normally we think of occupation or the international law certainly uh, uh, conceived of occupation as a temporary state of affairs, meaning one that is supposed to end quickly. And so this is, in a way, you could look at it like emergency measures, that you're accepting certain emergency measures uh, for a brief period of time until you have a political solution. And well, uh, I mean, I needn't tell you this has not been a temporary state of affairs. Uh, I needn't tell you that because uh, it's lasted 50 years so far, so far. And I say it's lasted 50 years, again, uh, thinking about it from the point of view of the humiliation, of the, in, the, the injustice, the injustice on the ground, the, 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 the daily pain that people have to uh, 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 go through every single day of their lives. And to think that the overwhelming majorities of Palestinians in the West Bank have known nothing but occupation. They were born under occupation. Many have, were born and died under occupation. So this is a lifetime for them. And, and then when you ask me personally as an analyst, we, we know we have all, we're, oh, is it one state, two states? Um, is there a, uh, 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 you know, uh, should we uh, support this diplomacy, that diplomacy? We all want to see diplomacy succeed at bringing about a just, equitable solution. But if you ask me as an analyst who've been at it for years, so tell me what is your best prediction 10 years from now? You look ahead and say, what is your best bet 10 years from now? Well, I have to tell you, obviously none of us know the, what's going to happen 10 years from now, so don't get me wrong. But if I had to put my money, where would I put my money? I would say status quo plus or minus with many more people dead and many more much more suffering along the way. That is the safest anal analyst bet, is to say nothing much is going to change except maybe a little more suffering and more death. Maybe give or take, maybe a little here, a little there, more annexation, more this and more that. And I think to myself, I think to myself, we've got to deal with the human lives in these territories, not based on the prospect of peace because that hasn't come and it doesn't look good now. And you gotta look at it as if this is what you get and fight for human rights every single day because that's all you've got. And I think for me, it should not, any possibility of a diplomacy which should not be opposed, should not take away from the real focus that should be our own 50 years from now, 50 years after 67, which is that there are people who's, who don't have basic rights living in those territories. And you've got to address that regardless of 
decouple diplomacy because diplomacy, what happened is that when we have diplomacy, people are saying, well, this is temporary. Be patient. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it. And there is some truth to it sometimes. But most of the time, it hasn't worked out that way. And we can't use diplomacy as a way to divert our attention from the human reality on the ground that is totally unacceptable. So that's number one. Number two, um, I say, uh, I already talked about how the Arabs are more divided than ever. Uh, I, uh, uh, their leverage has been diminished remarkably uh, given a whole set of issues that have taken place over the past several years. And we see that they're more divided than they're united, not only on Palestine, but even on issues that have to do with them. And look at this war in the Gulf uh, between members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, wealthy Arab states that has taken place right now, just as an example of that. Look at the leverage. So among Arab governments right now, there's certainly no unanimity on what to do on Palestine. And more depressingly, um, Arab publics are distracted. Uh, in the old days, it used to be true that the Arabs, uh, as a people, uh, focused on Palestine, even as the governments did not. And I've done many public opinion polls over the years to show that that issue uh, remains important in, among Arab people. Uh, as a symbol of their collective identity. Even an Egyptian sees Palestine as part of his identity. Certainly Arabs, as an Arab, see, see Palestine as part of their identity. And that used to be more the case. But now, as you know, Arabs are preoccupied. And, and, and legitimately so. If you're living in Syria, the hell that you're experiencing, uh, obviously, uh, you are focused on your tragedy. If you're living in Yemen, if you're living in Libya, if you're living in Iraq, uh, and all the challenges of the struggles internally that we're facing in much of the Arab world, it certainly distracts even the people from that issue. But one thing that is clear to me, that issue has not gone away from Arab minds, even in this arena. How do I know that? And let me give you just uh, uh, three examples. One is look at the two countries that have made uh, peace with Israel. There are only two states that have signed peace treaties, that is Jordan and Egypt. And you look at their public opinion, and the public opinion is the most opposed to relations with Israel. And in the public opinion polls, that was the, the most pro-Palestinian of, of the countries. And people are talking about cold peace between Egypt and Israel. Well, there is cold peace because the public is, is not there. And, and the public is focused on something else. It hasn't gone away, even in this environment. It hasn't gone away. Second, when you subconsciously, even as are preoccupied with something else, when you ask people, do you like Trump or don't you like Trump? Do you like um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Merkel or you don't like Merkel? There are many reasons why people like it or dislike it. But still, the shortest cut is to ask the question, what's their position on Israel-Palestine? It's still a subconscious test that people do in behind their mind. And you can see it in the discourse, even the, even, even the government-sponsored discourse, where, where they, they go through that to say, here's the example of it's not good for us because that's so subconsciously it's still there. And third is that when you are looking at Arab rulers who obviously are not focused on Palestine, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, none of them are focused on Palestine. Uh, everyone has their own struggle, in, in some cases survival struggle, that they're focused on. Not that they don't care about Palestine. I, I don't want to go that far because the publics will make sure that they do up to a point. But that's not a central issue for them, obviously not a central issue for them. And yet look at this war that we're now seeing between, whether it's between the Islamists or the secularists, uh, between uh, uh, you know, the, the different states' uh, coalitions in, in the Gulf, uh, and look at how one ruler tries to le delegitimize another ruler. How, what do they do to delegitimize the other ruler? The first thing to do is to claim they're working for Israel or that there's some Israeli connection that delegitimizes them, as is the case now. Stories about Qatar, stories about uh, 
you know, uh, the ambassador of the UAE in, in, in the US. All these stories in different presses tells you the fact that they're using it even as they're doing business with Israel, that they think the public is still focused on this issue. It's not going away. Uh, and, and this is a difficult time, it's a painful time, not just for the Palestinians. It is particularly difficult for the Palestinians to remember the, the 50th occasion, not to remember and not to forget the refugees, by the way, outside, and particularly the ones in, in places like Lebanese camps who are in, in a horrific, uh, under horrific conditions. Uh, but now we've had millions of refugees come out of Syria and Iraq. And so the tragedy is pervasive. And Palestinians have to also think about the rest of the Arab world, have empathy with others uh, as, as they want empathy for themselves. Uh, this is a painful period for the Arab world all the way around. This is no, not just for the Palestinians. And the Palestinians obviously pay more of a price because they're inevitably linked to other Arabs. And their prospects are inevitably linked by the leverage that Arabs uh, bring to bear. But this, of course, as we have seen in the history of the past century, is a not going to last. Uh, and Palestinians are not going away. Uh, Palestinian nationalism is reality and a fact. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, anything can change that fact. And uh, what is going on for the Palestinians beside this political consciousness and the fact that they have that the, they have broader sympathy beyond the Arab world with, on the human rights and international law dimension uh, is that Israel, frankly, does not have a unilateral ability to impose a lasting solution without them. And ultimately, uh, clearly, uh, there will be a day when Palestinians uh, will um, um, uh, find uh, certainly more dignity than they are finding today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit on Qatar? What is that all about? How uh, does on, it on what? On Qatar. Yeah. How does that fit into the Arab dynamic? Um, uh, that's a really long story, but I'm, I'm just going to give you sort of the short end of it because um, the, Qatar um, has had a, a contentious relationship with Saudi Arabia for a long time, and, and certainly back in the 1990s, and I, I think one reason why the Qatari started Al Jazeera was in a way to fight off some of the attacks they were getting from Saudi and, and uh, Egyptian media. But more recently, it's really my own opinion, it's, it's principally a function of their sympathy uh, with, the, with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and uh, Al Jazeera's independence from the narrative that is around them. That those two are big. They're all trying to, um, they've declared that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. Um, they have, uh, they've gone to war with and all the, th the, particularly Egypt and the United Arab Emirates, and certainly the Saudis came on board of that. Uh, and, and the Qataris uh, still are seen to be empowering them, uh, at, even as they've been declared as, the en as, uh, as, a, as a, a central enemy. So with uh, Trump coming on board and uh, uh, making a deal, particularly the Saudi-Trump uh, deal, um, it, it's obvious that they felt that they had a green light to, uh, to uh, exercise power. Uh, they've been trying to persuade Qatar to expel um, leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, and or speakers like uh, Yusuf al-Qaradawi uh, from, from there, or to clamp down Al Jazeera, meaning to either close it or to stop uh, putting out stories that are critical of, of Arab governments. Uh, and they've modified their style a little bit. They've responded up to a point, but not enough, obviously. And I think they've uh, seen this. Now, Iran obviously is part of the story, although I personally don't think the Iran story is the big piece of this, even though they're, it's being portrayed that way. I think it's more about the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, and uh, Al Jazeera. Sure. Yeah, George. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. That was a lovely presentation. I want you to change your focus a little bit on America and the 50th anniversary. And, and what? And th this 50th anniversary. OK. Were you, were you surprised how the New York Times and the Washington Post ran 
lengthy pieces and analysis on the on the issue, and what, while on the other side, the Arab diplomats, we've got over 50 Arab diplomats in Washington and New York, and and a new an active Palestinian uh, ambassador here, have not done anything to tell our side of the story. Yeah, I could go into. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that's a commentary more than a question, George. So um, it, it is, it is indeed puzzling. But that that goes to the point. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it goes to the point that I was making, which is, um, you know, Arabs want don't want to focus on this issue. They want they don't want something to uh, to to remind the publics of of, of this. Um, uh, and here in the U.S., obviously, you know. It's, it's remembered uh, in different ways, including many celebrated as the greatest Israeli victory, particularly you have a lot of support for Israel. So you can understand why that they, they're happier about telling the story, because it's not one of humiliation from the point of view of Israelis. But frankly, it was an occasion to tell the story about the occupation. And you find a lot of um, uh, uh, groups in America that have focused on uh, the humiliation and the, and. Uh, and, and the, the seemingly unending occupation, including, uh, to their credit, uh, the Jewish newspapers like Forward, you know, where they put out voices, uh, you know, that, that highlighted that. And we don't see the same thing in the Arab world. And this is, this is part of the tragedy that we're, that we're witnessing today. Uh, well, as I said, I think the way I explain it is that they're waging wars that had nothing to do with Palestine right now. Uh, some of them see it as wars of survival, the wars of narrative. Uh, they don't want their opponents to gain an upper hand in that. Palestine plays into their opponents' hands, and they don't want that. And so they keep it out as much as possible. And I think that's that's the, the real the real story. Any other questions? Thank you very much.